I don't read a lot of fiction, but I do read quite a lot of non-fiction. And one category I, I like to read is the war memoir. I suppose there's a strong bias uh, to the World War II British memoir, but uh, memoirs from, from all nationalities and, and periods that I can get my hands on. And recently I've been uh, reading or rereading uh, a lot of British World War II stuff, and I, I think I might make a number of videos. Um, um, I will, I hope, be reading from Ken Toot, or is it to uh, or tout uh, as masterpiece tank i've written to the publishers for permission to uh, read from that and i really hope that they say yes because that is such a masterpiece um uh, mailed fist is uh, another one i would strongly recommend by john foley he was a, a churchill tank commander in world war ii and a very good teller of anecdotes this is a very very funny book with lots of very funny anecdotes in it and some amazing anecdotes and we're clearly very lucky to have mr foley because uh, five times in this book he describes occasions when he was very, very, very nearly killed. Um, but today uh, I'm going to be talking mainly about uh, this book, uh, Troop Leader by Bill Bellamy. Now, uh, Bill Bellamy was a troop leader, that is to say he was the commander of a troop of tanks. Typically that's three or four tanks. In this case, most of the time it was three Cromwell tanks. Uh, now, the Cromwell tank was a cavalry tank. In World War II, the British uh, had divided their tanks into infantry tanks and cavalry tanks. Now, uh, there were, of course, infantry regiments and cavalry regiments of old, and the, these, uh, these regiments kept their philosophies and their identities. And so they would refer to... Um, there are some memoirs, for instance, you can read the entire thing and no one is ever called a soldier. Uh, the, the various soldiers are instead referred to as lancers and hussars and fusiliers and grenadiers and guardsmen and so forth. They've all got their regimental categorizations used instead of soldier or tank crewman or whatever. Uh, anyway, cavalry tanks uh, were used as cavalry of old and they still had the idea of uh, what the cavalry was used for. It's for pursuing the enemy, it's for breaking through, it's for, it's for surrounding the enemy and it's for scouting. And um, they even used the same vocabulary. So for instance, when you got out of your tank, that was called dismounting. If your tank was knocked out and you were on foot walking back to your friendly lines, you'd be referred to as being dishorsed or unhorsed. Um, so uh, they, they were quite definitely a cavalry regiment with a cavalry regiment's mentality. And it's interesting to read about him, for instance, uh, going behind enemy lines with just three tanks, going up a hill, camouflaging the tanks, and spending the day looking around the countryside through binoculars and radioing in whatever they had seen. They're, they're scouting, just like cavalry of old. Um, anyway, so Cromwell was a fast tank, and so it was issued to cavalry units. And um, I'm going to relate a couple of anecdotes. Now, the first of these uh, is uh, when they were going through Holland. Now, they'd just uh, been liberating bits of Holland. They'd received an ecstatic welcome. The streets were filled with people waving Union flags and orange flags and, and the girls throwing flowers and climbing up onto the tanks and, and, and kissing all the crewmen. And uh, uh, <laughs> quite amusingly, he says that they quickly found out that it was impossible to be selective with who uh, kissed you. And so they found it generally better to duck. Um, and uh, something that uh, is commonly reported, actually, in memoirs is how embarrassed people are to receive ecstatic welcomes. Because when there is a column of, of troops and tanks and vehicles moving through a town like that, it's sort of on parade and the, the, the streets are filled with people, that's because the, the town has already been liberated. The guys who did the hard, dangerous work of liberating that town, they're not the guys who are getting all the applause and, and love and flowers and kisses and wine going through the town. And so those guys are often quite embarrassed to, to get this hero's welcome when they didn't think, oh, actually, we didn't liberate you. We're not the heroes here. But anyway, um, so at this point in the war, the Germans are in fast retreat. And um, Bill Bellamy has not seen any hostile Germans for some while, though there's been very fierce fighting in the past. But now he's feeling a little bit safer, a little bit more relaxed. It's a lovely sunny day. He's zooming along in his tank. He's got the wind in his hair. It all seems rather nice. And to his right, there is a 40 foot embankment. And he's been sent to scout uh, to see if a particular bridge is usable. And he can't see the bridge because it's the other side of the embankment. Anyway, he looks behind him and he sees that the other tanks are quite a bit further behind. Their, their tanks are slower and he's zooming along and uh, he notices the place where you can go through the embankment up ahead of him. And so he goes through and well, see, normally what he would do is he'd get out of the tank and go up the embankment, have a look around with his binoculars first. But, you know, we haven't seen any hostile Germans for a while. That'll be fine. So he just says, right, driver, you know, turn the corner here. Let's have a look. And he goes through and he's looking through his binoculars at the 
bridge which has been very thoroughly des destroyed and he's just right thinking right i'm gonna to have to radio in the bridges out and then he uses this slightly corny phrase suddenly all hell was let loose his tank is being hit by something big it's not a machine gun it's something much bigger than that and uh, he's so discombobulated they just, just, just drive a reverse and they just fire the machine guns at random as they zoom back through the embankment and they get under cover again and <gasps> is everyone all right is everyone all right yeah we're all fine he gets out the tank he runs up the embankment and he looks through his binoculars and he sees ah he sees a german lorry with a a, a quad anti-aircraft gun two centimeter thing on the back of it going off at breakneck speed oh he should have stayed there and dueled it out he would have won his tank with its thick armor and the big gun would easily have won against that thing but uh, he uh, never mind he goes back down to the tank and um his crewmen are looking at the front of the tank and they're saying well that's funny here come and look at this and he looks at the front of the tank and he says well that's funny because he sees that the two centimeter anti-aircraft gun shells are just sticking in the front of his tank like like so many arrows in a target he, he, he describes them as looking as though they were spot welded on they'd stuck their points into the armor and though they, they were sticking out in that sort of way you know that 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 shells don't he thinks that's really funny and a motorcyclist after a while from the light aid detachment is summoned and he turns up and he looks at it and he says well, well that's funny and uh, then later they they seek out the regimental quartermaster and he looks at it and he says well that's funny hey, what's 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 the, the t number of this tank hmm. what's what's the serial number of this tank hmm. it's just not listed right oh right yes you shouldn't be using this tank it's not a battle tank it's not armored it's a training tank it turns out that instead of the three inches of hardened steel at the front they had one or two inches of non-hardened steel at the front of their tank which explained why it was so much faster than all the other tanks oh yeah that would explain that wouldn't it um and uh, he was given the simple order to go to the depot and pick himself out a proper battle tank now you may think that uh, that's a pretty extraordinary anecdote already but but I think perhaps more extraordinary is, is the punchline to the anecdote, which is that very quickly all his crew protested. His crewmen said, no, 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 no. We've come all the way through France and Belgium, through so many dangers, so many of our colleagues have been knocked out. We haven't any of us suffered a scratch. This is our lucky tank. And they refused to swap for an actual proper battle tank. They kept their lucky tank. Um, and uh, and they did all survive the war so there you go i suppose it was their their lucky tank and evidence for this is something that happened uh, on another occasion also going through holland uh, now what they're supposed to do is fan out and and prowl along the, the, the countryside in a you know, sort of big roaming we are cavalry galloping through the fields way but something that rather spoiled this was that they would then come to drainage ditches and canals and they would have to all then line up and go single file across the bridge and then they could fan out again and become cavalry tanks romping along the the countryside with their tracks vroom 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 and uh, they went roughly in line through a hedge and found themselves in amongst an awful lot of germans um there were german infantry and there were rather disconcertingly four 88 millimeter flak guns in the field Ah, now an 88 millimeter flat gun these are the guns which had knocked out hundreds of tanks in operation goodwood not that long ago uh, and one of these could and famously could put a hole straight through the armor of a cromwell tank they were in tremendous danger they were uh, just firing their guns at random he leant out of the turret and fired the, the the smoke canisters and just went left hard left go 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 and they that top speed veered left turned round and went crashing back through the head at this point there are bullets pinging off them the, the german infantry are firing everything they've got at them there are the panzer shreks going past them an 88 millimeter gun zooming past them when they first entered the field um two of the the anti-aircraft guns were pointing still straight into the sky but two of them Achtung, die Frau Milch, were already in the act of, of moving towards them and so he uses, he uses the the expression this rousing reception lent us wings yeah um so he's gone hard left and fight and goes crashing back through the hedge again but of course he's gone around the great big arc and that means that the bridge they crossed to get here is now hundreds of yards over to their left 
uh, and they don't really want to go across the enemy's front to get to it. Um, so he just says, OK. He uses the word steeplechase. There you go, still thinking like a horseman. We're going to jump the canal. So he says there was luckily a little bit of a ramp. And he says, just go over it. And they, they jump the canal. And in midair, he remembers to shout, remember to declutch. And when they hit the ground, the driver was a very good driver. He declutched. And so when they hit the ground, the wheels were not connected to the engine. And they free wheeled for a bit along the ground. And then they are able to uh, let the clutch off, reconnect the engine, and vroom, roar off. He then looks around behind him. And 100 yards behind him, the next tank has also somehow miraculously not been hit by anything and is about to make its jump. Unfortunately, the driver in that tank wasn't uh, quite so good and didn't remember to declutch. So he takes off, lands on the field the other side, bang, in a screaming fit of protesting gears. And the whole tank then pitches right up onto its nose and all the gubbins, all the boxes, all the bed rolls, all these spare ammunition cans and fuel that, that, that was uh, stored on the back of the tank is then catapulted in a, in a graceful parabola across the field. But then it comes back onto its uh, uh, wheels again. And amazingly, the tracks have not broken and they're able to get away. The third tank was known to be a slower tank. And so they were somewhat uh, worried for it. It takes off and instead of landing on the flat, the other side of the canal, it lands boom on the edge of the canal and teeters there for a while with its tracks flailing like crazy and gouging great bits of the bank off and manages to haul itself up and off and they all get away. Sometime later, um, when that field had been cleared and they were able in safety to go forwards, they measured and found that they had jumped over 20 feet of water. So there you go. Even in the World War II tank, if it's a fast tank like a Cromwell, cavalry tank, you can actually, when you're being shot at and things are desperate enough, you can jump a canal. Did the 